Hi, my name is Brandon Kirkham and I'm the Costume Crafts Head here at Santa Fe Opera. And uh, aside from Costume Crafts, I'm also a puppet maker. Uh, so I thought it might be fun to share with you guys a, a little bit of a step-by-step, -step, kind of a crash course in how to make um, foam puppet heads, like moving mouth heads. Uh, a little bit like the Muppets, uh, they're probably the most famous ones. Uh, so what we're going to make today is kind of like a, like a Bert, like from Bert and Ernie, like a head similar to that in construction. So. Um, the first thing uh, that I would like to introduce you guys to is different types of foam. We're going to be, today we're going to be using these two foams, uh, but there are a lot of foams out there and just some pointers that you might need to know when you're ordering, when you're working with them, stuff like that. So um, this is the most common kind of foam. Um, I call it polyfoam. This is like what is in your, most couches and stuff have, have this as their base. Like it's, it's the most generic kind of upholstery foam. You can pick it up anywhere, even like a Hobby Lobby or Michaels or Joann's or something like that. So this is this is the polyfoam, or at least what I call polyfoam. Um, we'll stop for one second and I'll say that uh, you should just know that uh, because there are so many different types of foams and so many different manufacturers, everybody has a little bit of different naming system. So for instance, some places might call this a reticulated foam, some places might call this an open cell foam. Um, dry fast or drain dry are other like brand names uh, for, for instance. So this is just one type of foam that has a lot of different names and these all do. So just know that when you're going into buying and purchasing that you may have to do a little bit of research. Most places will send you samples, um, but that's just something good to know. So we talked about polyfoam. This is the other foam that we're gonna use today. Um, it is similar to a polyfoam. It's a little bit denser. Foam also comes in different densities. Um, I think this one the manufacturer calls charcoal foam, which is you know super creative of them in their naming process. Um, we're going to use this as a substitute for the reticulated foam today. The reticulated foam is a little bit denser. It has this open cell structure, um, so there's a lot of air and breathing in there. Uh, one of the cool things about this uh, is that it's used for a lot of outdoor upholstery, air filters, things like that. Um, it dries really fast. It's a really primo foam. It's what I really like to use for the, the largest part of this head. This was just a mock-up that I made. Um, it's dyeable, uh, just with even a writ dye will dye it really nicely. Uh, it's also stitchable, which is really nice. If you're working in a place that doesn't have a lot of ventilation, um, to be able to stitch your puppets is really nice and it'll save your lungs and your health and not give you cancer, which is you know a good thing. Um, all foams come in different densities, so this, you know, here's a one inch, and I think this is either inch and a half or two inches. It's the same stuff. This is a styrofoam. This is a bead styrofoam. This is really great for sculpting, mold, uh, uh, for making sculpts. Uh, it sands down really nicely. It's hard. It comes also in different densities. Um, the densities for this are usually rated by pounds. Um, I think this is probably a two pound foam there. This is a hybrid foam. It's like the poly foam, but it actually has some latex in it. So uh, sometimes you'll see it sold as like pin core latex or mattress topper or things like that. We're not really gonna use that today. It's great for fat pads and things like that though. These are high density foams. These are used for a lot in like mascot costumes, sports padding, knee pads, things like that. Um, I use it for a lot of really large puppets um, that you need to have a lot of structure. It's easy to clean, you can just wipe it down. Um, L200 is a form of, of this type of foam uh, that's kind of you know big on the market right now for cosplay and a lot of things like that. Um, it comes in different colors, different thicknesses, all of that as well. Floral foam is another type. It's a hard foam, like the styrofoam, but it also, you can crush it, you know, do all sorts of stuff, jam your flowers down in there. Um, it absorbs water also, so for floral, it's really nice. And um, you can also, in the, this is something we we're gonna use potentially for Rasulka Ris this season, so this was bought from a taxidermy company. This is another type of hard foam um, that's actually made in a mold. Uh, so they actually pour the chemicals into the mold, it expands to fit the shape of the mold, and they pop it out. And you get this nice little antelope fellow. Um, but we're not gonna use that. 
So that's a really brief uh, introduction to phones. And I guess the big takeaway is just do some investigation and some playing around with different types before you start building. It's also uh, interesting to think about where you can get these different types of phones. So there are all sorts of phone manufacturers. Um, upholstery shops and things like that usually have good samples. Um, I usually use a company called Active Foam. Uh, I live in the Midwest and there are distributors of, from that brand all around and they have their own naming system as well. Uh, Foam Mart uh, is another good option. Atlas Foams in Ohio is good. Um, yeah, just do a Google search and you will start seeing uh, different, different options in your area. Uh, a lot of times you can get pricing. Uh, you can work with the companies, especially in these large distributors and manufacturers. You can usually work with them, get some discounts. Um, I found that if you're worried about the cost of a particular type of foam, just talk to them. And if you order a little bit in bulk, um, it'll, it might actually be as cheap as the poly foam. Um, shipping is the real cost uh, in a lot of ways, just because it's big and bulky and takes up a lot of room on a truck. But that's a little bit about where to get the foams. So this is the basic shape of what we're going to be making today. Um, as, you, as I mentioned before, this is the polyfoam. We're actually gonna be building it out of the charcoal foam. Um, in an ideal world, we would be building out of the reticulated foam, but for today's purposes, um, we're just gonna be gluing our project together. Um, the basic shape of this, you know, you've got, you've got the pod head, you've got room for the mouth plate here, which we'll talk about in depth in a few minutes. And uh, then you have this little piece here that's the cheek. And the pattern piece looks like this. So um, this comes together to make the front of the face. This is your center front line. And this is the mouth opening. So this little circle here, this is the cheek. Um, so if you, if you ever notice on the Muppets, they have that kind of distinctive smile line uh, cheek piece, uh, cheek. Uh, this is the piece that makes that happen. And you usually make that out of a little bit less dense foam, uh, a softer foam uh, will, will move uh, really nicely with your puppet mouth. So, so this is what we're gonna be making today. Um, for those of you who make costumes uh, and work as stitchers or things like that, um, you'll, we're gonna be talking about some easing and how to ease foam together with gluing instead of stitching. Or if you were stitching, that would you know, be the method. But you can see here, like we've got a little bit of shaping that's gonna have to happen on this seam and this seam. Um, foam, I love working with foam. It's, it's a little bit, it's, it's how my mind works. It's intuitive to me. Um, it's, like, it's like draping in three dimensions um, with a fabric that will stand up. That's what I like to tell people when they're talking about how to, how to pattern and just think of it like a fabric that stands up on its own. Um, so yeah, without further ado, let's start laying out the pattern pieces and get those cut. So the first step that we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be laying out our pattern piece on the foam. Uh, one of the cool things about foam is that you don't have to worry about a grain direction. Uh, so uh, you can literally nest them in as tightly as you can to save, you know, save resources. Uh, because this foam is so dark, I'm just using a paint marker and I'm just going to trace around my pattern with the paint marker. It also helps if your pattern piece has been backed on some cardboard or poster board or something like that to give it a little body so it doesn't move around. It's kind of hard to pin into foam and it also leaves some marks, so uh, I, I try not to do too much pinning into the foam itself. So we're gonna need two of these, so we'll just flip this. Um, once we cut it, we'll be able to see just a little bit of a faintness of our red line, and so we'll know that that's the inside or the outside when we're gluing things together. So do go ahead and flip your pattern piece. If you're running really tight on foam, uh, you don't need to do that. Like if it only fits in one direction, uh, that's totally fine. You just need to remember as the builder when you're gluing it together, <laughs> that that's how you've laid out the pattern piece. Foam is a very um, unique material. Um, in some ways, it's very forgiving. You can, I use the word wudge a lot. You can wudge it and make it do things. Uh, you can kind of manipulate it as you're gluing. Um, the pattern pieces are very useful, but I, I think having a little bit of just intuition as you're gluing uh, 
is, is maybe the most important thing. And we'll talk about that later. But for, for instance, if you start gluing from the top of the seam, it might look different than had you started at the bottom and worked your way up. Generally, as a rule, I, I start at the top and work my way down. Um, and that just helps me know what to expect the foam's gonna look like at the end. So, now that we've got these pieces ready, we have, this is called a Persona Blade. That's just the brand name. It's actually used for barbers and uh, hairstylists. Um, they're super sharp. They have a blade that comes down onto the edges here. They last a long time. I really, really like them. You can also use X-Acto blades um, or snap-off blades or things like that. Um, the most important thing when you're cutting is to remember to use a mat. And remember to keep your keep your blade in at a 90 degree angle because if there's too much of a bevel, that's gonna change the shape of the head uh, or whatever you're working on. So try and do a good job of maintaining, you know, a straight up and down, you know, don't cut like this or this, try to cut this way. So we're just gonna start cutting this. I try to stay just, just to the inside of the, of the marker line. You'll get a, as I mentioned before, you'll get a little bit of a shadow on there and that'll help you remember which side is which as you're gluing up. When you get to darts, like really sharp darts, I like to go just a little bit further than the dart um, to make sure that I have plenty to play with there and it also give you a smoother curve. This blade is gonna be fine for our purposes today, but um, one thing, a little trick that I like to do, they're a little pricey. Um, you buy them in bulk, but they can be a little pricey. Um, to get more life out of them, you can just take a little bit of sewing machine oil, have a scrap of foam here, that have a scrap of foam like this, that has some uh, sewing machine oil on it, and just do this, and it actually will cut down on the friction, and it'll make your blades last longer. So we're just gonna cut out these two pattern pieces before we move on to the next step. The little circle here is a little bit difficult. The sharper the blade, the better. Remember to keep your blade at a 90 degree angle as much as possible. You can also go in afterwards and trim it up, but it's best to do it in the first cut. We're gonna oil this blade before the next one. So here's our first piece. We're gonna do that one more time and uh, then I'll rejoin you for cutting the cheek pieces. So the next piece we're gonna cut is our cheek piece, this little pie with a slice taken out here. Um, we're gonna be using that softer polyfoam for that. Um, it'll just make sure that our mouth opens and closes. It just has a lot of flexibility in there. Um, and that's what that cheek piece does. So we'll lay out our pattern piece again. Um, I use Sharpie most of the time. Um, if you're doing a really light colored puppet or depending on how your final finishing is gonna be on the puppet, do keep in mind things like, uh, is, is the Sharpie going to show through the fabric or whatever that final covering is? Um, there are ways to dye the foam. So that's, you know, that's another thing to consider. So if you're going to be using a reticulated foam. Now, I should also note that this stuff usually comes in, it's usually white when you get it. Um, the sun and time air will eventually yellow it. Um, it will yellow and the color will change over the years if you're dyeing it as well, but um, the dye I think actually kind of helps hide some of the yellowing. Uh, but usually this comes in a white. Um, this has been here for probably many years. Um, so that's just a thing to know. Uh, it will eventually break down. Um, all foams will eventually break down, uh, especially you know as they're exposed to sweat on the inside of a puppeteer's hand. Um, you know all of that stuff over the years is going to break down the foam, and they'll need to be refurbished. But that's why you make pattern pieces so that you can just go back to your file and make that puppet again. Um, in cutting thin foams, 
it is totally possible to use craft scissors. I mean, this cuts really nicely. Um, this would be totally fine if you don't want to use the knife blade. I would warn against it um, when you're cutting a thicker foam. So this is the same foam, but in, in green, um, and it's a little bit thicker. Um, one thing that happens when you're trying to cut with scissors, especially on a thicker foam, and I'm exaggerating here just a little bit to be able to show you, but it's really easy to get these ridges, and those ridges come up every time you open and close the scissors. Um, I just like to keep a much cleaner edge than that uh, as much as possible so that when you're gluing you don't get little bumps and things like that. So we're going to go back to this, we're going to, I've oiled the knife blade, and we're just going to cut out our little wedges before we move on to the next step. You might notice that I also like to move the foam more than the blade. There are just certain angles that you can do a better cut. Um, and so it's easier to just move the foam. If you get some weirdness on these circle shapes that are a little hard, you can always go back in and trim off any weirdness. Um, that's totally acceptable. And now we're ready to glue our pieces together. So one thing I just thought of to mention uh, as we we're cutting out these pieces, we're getting lots of foam scraps. Uh, your studio will be filled with them if you're making a full puppet, especially or mini puppets. Um, some people don't know it, but foam scraps are recyclable. Um, so most of the manufacturers, um, it's, it, there's a good chance that wherever you bought it from, if it's a local place, you can just take it and drop off. I just drop off trash bags full of foam scraps. What they do is they throw them in a chipper and then they fuse them back together. Um, and then that's used for things like carpet padding or the insides of punching bags and stuff like that. So when possible, let's try to reuse. Um, foam is not the best thing for the environment, so let's try and, uh, try and recycle it when we can. Okay, so before we move on to the gluing, um, and we're going to move into the spray booth for that because uh, a lot of these glues are really to toxic. So let's just talk here about some of the glues that we're going to be using. Um, barge is probably the most common glue that you're going to find in shops and things like that. We use it for shoe rubbering and lots of repairs, leather work, stuff like that. That's probably the most common. It comes with a thinner, or you can order a thinner for it. I usually like to thin out the barge um, in a glass jar or something uh, so that it spreads nicer. I think like the consistency of uh, not quite, somewhere between maple syrup and honey is the consistency that I like to go for. Um, here's some that I've put in a jar and you can kind of see how that moves around. Um, that's gonna spread really nicely. This is just some stuff that I've already thinned out. Um, the glue that I like to use the most, like when I'm in my home, uh, in my workshop, um, I use master cement. Um, it's very similar to barge. It's also a contact cement. And um, what I like about it is it's a little less stinky. Um, I try to have very good ventilation, but but it is a consideration. Um, and it it just naturally has that that. Uh, consistency that we make the barge have the consistency. So I really like this one. It also comes with a, th or you can order a thinner for it as well. Um, I also really like to use a glue pot um, or a glue pyramid cone thing, I guess is what they're called. Um, for big projects or things like that, like I just keep one of these, uh, you know, handy uh, for what I'm doing. Um, it's made of Teflon and steel that won't stick. Um, this part is also made of Teflon. The brush is a nice acid brush and um, it seals itself up really nicely so you can just keep your glue there without having to constantly be putting it back and forth into jars and things like that so um, and then I'll also just add you know add thinners and stuff like that to the pot as needed to get the consistency. Um, the third glue that we're going to be using today is just Fabri-Tac. Um, Beacon has a lot of different uh, adhesive products. Um, I've used a couple others of theirs that work really well Though the names are escaping me right now, um, just like uh, if you go to the store and they don't have Fabri-Tac, there's generally like another option there that's going to work pretty similarly. It's got the same bottle, and um, but this is the other thing. I like to use this for like a lot of the fine finishing. Um, it's not as strong as barge or master cement, but uh, it's really nice for finishing details especially. Um, so when we move to the spray booth, um, I, you will see me, I will be suited up in gloves and have a respirator. Um, 
we'll also have a good airflow coming through the spray booth. Um, that's really important, guys, and can't really undersell that or oversell that point too much. Uh, take care of yourself when you're working. Uh, this, these chemicals are dangerous, and they're they're mutagens, and they're just gonna they're gonna curse you later in life if you don't use appropriate safety measures. Um, if you don't have a place to glue comfortably or uh, the equipment of a respirator or things like that, um, I would actually suggest this foam. This was the reticulated that we talked about earlier. Um, one of the cool things about it is that it is stitchable. Um, so what you would do, assuming these were your two pieces that you're trying to put together, and also assuming that they were the same uh, we're gonna make them the same. Um, you would butt them together, and you can just run a really nice little whip stitch up this side and up this side. Uh, take a few stitches, pull them tight, um, and they'll start to disappear. If you're gonna have this as your final covering, like if you were going to then dye this, make sure you use a thread that um, is either dyeable or that will um, disappear once the foam is dyed. Um, but that's another really nice technique, and. Frankly, with dry times and things like that, it's just as quick sometimes to just stitch up your puppets. Um, do make sure you do both sides. And that's my, those are my thoughts on that. Um, coming back to the idea of gluing, uh, you will see me working with this. Uh, I don't have any acid brushes here today, but we're, so we're just gonna use some disposable chip brushes. Um, and I'm gonna be gluing along the edges that I want to, that I want to glue together. So I'll, be, I'll have both of these pattern pieces uh, and we're gonna start. We're gonna start with this top dart. Um, that's gonna be the side of the head here, and then we're gonna also glue out this dart. And we're gonna start with that on both of these pieces, and then we'll start putting them together. Um, when you're gluing, what I like to do, and everybody has a little bit, you know, different techniques of what they like to do. I like to take the brush and just kind of dab some on the edge, and then I'll take a piece of the reticulated foam. And for those of you who do makeup, you might notice this, it's essentially a stipple sponge. And then go back through and kind of stipple the glue. This is why it's nice that it is thinner. Um, stipple the glue to get it all over the seams. You do want to be careful about glue burn, uh, which is just the glue that comes out and oozes out, or you know, if you're not careful along the edges, especially if you're not going to be covering it in fur or fabric as a final finish, you want to be really careful about that. Um, and um, other things to watch out for, when we're putting this together, remember that we're gonna be easing this seam and easing this seam. And if you watch closely, you can see kind of how I'm gonna be doing that. Uh, you won't be able to hear me, but you'll be able to see me do that uh, when we start putting the pieces together. Um, when you put the pieces together, I like to do them flat, and you'll see me do this. I actually will work flat as much as possible to get a nice clean front and back, hopefully, you know, because you want the you want the edges to meet right up with each other. Um, you know, this was just a mock-up that I made the other day, and it's not the cleanest. And I'm trying, and I know there's some examples here. You know, for instance, right here, you can see where I didn't line that up. That's going to be a little it's going to be a little bump. Now it's going to be fine once I cover it, but depending on what you do, um, you just want to watch out for that. Another really important thing to do or to remember. So once you have this glue together, the glue is still sticky. Make sure you don't do this. Don't, don't crush your seam because then you're just gonna have a flat spot that's not going to be as strong um, as the other areas. So uh, use the glue sparingly for that reason as well um, and just be very attentive to how you're putting it together. Um, this is probably the most important, this is the way you could really screw up the project is gonna be in the gluing. So. Uh, and I've done that, I know that from lots of experience and having done it a million times, but, but work with it, you'll learn, do samples, um, don't waste your big project, uh, don't screw that up because you forgot and you squeezed the, the uh, seam together. So that's what I've got to say about glue, so this next part will just be in the spray booth and you'll just kind of see me working uh, and uh, that's, that's the plan. <laughs> Greetings. This is the spray booth at the Santa Fe Opera. Uh, there are multiple ones throughout the campus, but this is the one for costumes. Uh, so we use this for gluing and spray painting and all sorts of things. Anything that's toxic and airborne that we need to protect ourselves and our lungs and, and inhalation process. So we have cabinets where we store all that stuff in here as well.
So we should talk about dry time when we're thinking about contact cements. Um, the way contact cements work, you put, you put your glue on uh, both surfaces that are going to be glued together, and then you wait for it to dry. Um, I don't wait till it's like bone dry. Uh, I try to find when it's tacky um, so that you can still work with it uh, and, and do some things with it. That's a little bit of experimentation. I can tell you out here in Santa Fe, uh, glues dry a lot faster uh, because just because of our altitude and uh, just how uh, dry the air is. Uh, when I'm working at my studio in the Midwest, you know, barge might take forever to dry. So that's just gonna take some experimentation on your part, but worth mentioning. So as you're putting the cheeks, the little cheek wedges inside the rest of the face, um, I just wanted to point out, and you'll notice that the, the uh, circumference of the little cheek insert is larger than the cutout in the, in the other foam uh, where, where it's going to be inset. Uh, this is a place where you're gonna wanna ease that in. Uh, again, you know, just think of, thinking of it like you know, easing in fabric. Um, it's the same sort of idea. Uh, I usually try to open open things up as you can see, like open the hole up as you can see here, uh, and then start from the center and then work around um, to uh, to make a nice finished piece. Okay, so I just want to go back and uh, amend something I said earlier about pinching foam. Uh, here you can see that I am pinching the foam, but if you notice, like I'm pinching it along the seam just on one side. I'm being really careful not to squeeze the whole thing together and get it stuck. Um, I think that's important to point out because pinching it is how you get it, you know, very gently pinching is how you get the seam cleaned up uh, as you're gluing together.
Okay, here you see I've had a little bit of trouble with the glue uh, drying too much, and also I had pinched the little uh, wedge for the cheek uh, too much, and so it's stuck together. So, a really cool thing about barge uh, and most contact cements is that you can take a hair dryer, if you're really careful, take a hair dryer, uh, blow dry along there for a few seconds uh, until you start to feel it loosen up, get uh, tacky again, and uh, then you can go back and fix what you had done earlier. It's not, you know, it's for time saving and you know to be cleaner you should you should try and get it right the first time but life is life and that doesn't always happen so we have finished gluing up our puppet head these are all the foam pieces that we were just gluing together in the last shots um, you can see now how it's going to work uh, you can also see uh, that there's a little bit of glue burn there some sloppy areas um, I just wanted to point that out uh, because you know, normally I would try and be a little bit careful, but I'm using different foam, different brushes, uh, you know, all sorts of different things here uh, while I'm at the shop. So, uh, but I just want you guys to know you can get cleaner than this. Um, uh, that, especially if you're going to be building from a reticulated foam that you're then going to be dyeing or something like that. You, you really don't want all of this glue burn. So, um, so just wanted to point that out. So the next step in our process though is the mouth plate. So as cool as this thing is, um, the mouth plates are really important. Um, if you think of your puppet head as a machine, the mouth plate is the engine. You know that's what drives everything, and that's what you know that's what you, the puppeteer, are going to be connected to. That's the way you're going to be connected to the puppet. So, um, what I like to use is uh, birch plywood. Um, a lot of times, this is used for model airplanes. Now, we've already cut these pieces out on a bandsaw, um, so you won't get to see that process. But I just kind of lay those out. Um, I create the pattern uh, based off of the size of the puppet head. Um, something interesting to note is that there is a 45 degree bevel right here and right here, so on top and bottom. And then there's a third piece, and not everybody does this, but this is a method that I was taught that I really, really enjoy, um, and it's also beveled. And by having this third piece inside your mouth plate, um, that gives you, uh, when, you're, when you're actually manipulating the puppet, it gives you the opportunity to do things like this, like uh, make the bottom lip stick out, make the top lip stick out. It also, um, you know, with Muppets and these moving mouth puppets, you know, we're wrapping fleece and things like that on the inside. Sometimes we're putting teeth and things in there. Um, it also just gives like a little bit of an extra gap in there so you're not uh, squeezing down on the, you're not fighting the force of of the teeth or the lips or whatever else in there. So um, I really like this little extra piece that we put in there. So now we're going to start working on the mouth plate. So once you have your pieces cut, and I know I mentioned this earlier, but uh, uh, using a bandsaw is the most efficient way. So you just lay your, you lay your pieces out on the little pieces of plywood. Uh, I always just cut this curve out and leave a little bit extra at the back. And then I tilt the table of my bandsaw to a 45 degree angle uh, to get this cut, these cuts here, here, and along both sides of this strip. Uh, uh, special thanks to Jim in the scene shop. He actually cut these out for me, which was super nice because we don't have a bandsaw here in the shop. Now, if you don't have a bandsaw at home, uh, there are other ways to cut the plywood. Um, it's only about 3 16 of an inch, so you can get through it. I mean, theoretically, you could take an X-Acto knife and just do a million little cuts. Um, that would be one way. Um, another way would be to just use something different. Um, mat board does work. Um, I've even made them out of cardboard. Um, with cardboard, you wanna make sure you pay attention to the direction of the corrugation um, and do a little bit of experimentation. Sometimes you can even like laminate two pieces together. Um, I like the plywood because it's thin and it's sturdy. Um, other options, I used to actually make FOSS-shaped plates. Uh, for those of you who might uh, know that product, it's a, it's a heat shrink felt uh, that we use a lot in the crafts world. Um, I would use those and then actually wire the edges as if you would like in millinery making a hat. Um, the problem with that and the problem with a lot of those softer materials is that over time they're going to start to break down. Um, some puppeteers really like that. They like what happens when it gets a little soft and squishy. You know, you can do some more of the like Kermit things, you know, when he like squishes up his entire mouth. And, um, uh, I tend to like a little bit more predictable um, and that's just, a, that's just a point of preference uh, and you would just talk to your client as you're making the puppet. So that's a little bit about cutting the plates and using the material. The next thing we're going to do 
um, is make the finger loops that help us hold on to the puppet. So um, the puppet's mouth is not going to sit all the way. For a long time when I was making puppets, I thought you had to have your mouth plate sit all the way back here, which makes like a really, really large, unsightly puppet mouth. Um, I learned that that is not, you know, that is not what you have to do. Really, you know, having a little bit of flexibility to do this and that and do change some angles and stuff like that is really fun. And this additional plate in there also helps that. Uh, it gives you a little bit more room. But you need a way for it to stay to your hand. So what I like to use, um, I like to use suede leather. So it's got the suede side on the front and the back. Um, just cut a couple strips. You know, these I think are just inch long strips. And I've marked out where my fingers want to sit. So my, my pointer finger is gonna sit across one line, my ring finger is gonna sit across the other, and this finger is just gonna be, my, my middle finger is just gonna be kinda hanging out in there. Um, and we're going to wrap those, make little elastic loops that go around these two fingers, so, so pointer and uh, ring. Um, and that's what's gonna hold it in. And, and on the other plate, there will be uh, a corresponding loop for your thumb to go inside. So, once you've built a puppet, you don't wanna have to take it apart all the time to fix broken things. So, uh, this is kind of an important step of the process is making sure everything is well adhered, well secured. Um, I like to, so for instance, I'm gonna be stitching these elastic pieces down to this, but um, Often what I'll also do is glue it down with barge first and then stitch over the top just to make sure, you know, that if one of those threads comes loose, you know, that the whole thing isn't going to come out. Because it's a real pain in the butt to have to go in and do surgery on a puppet. Um, uh, so, we've got our suede strips. Uh, this is about an inch. I've got one inch elastic. I've cut these into about four inch strips right now. And I've measured out on my fingers what the right distance is. For me, it's about an inch and three quarters between, and then I'll leave about three quarters of an inch on either side. So, imagine that you've glued this down first. And uh, I'm just gonna do a straight stitch on the machine. And just go back and forth, back and forth, because you want it to be really, really secure. That's probably enough right there. You don't want, you know, you could stitch this too much and just actually perforate the leather so bad that the that the le the little elastic pieces are just going to come off. I usually do just about what you saw me do there. A lot of back and forth back stitching. And then we're going to do it for this other guy for the other side. make one for the bottom for your thumb so you're just gonna have one at the center and then I usually leave like an inch on either side to glue down securely no one's ever gonna see these they're a little bit rough you know but that's okay um, they're kind of a pain in the butt to make, uh, I think, uh, in the process. So like if I'm making a bunch of puppets, well actually every time I make these, I'll just end up making like 15, 20 of them uh, and to, just to be able to pull from the next time I'm making stuff. I'll do the same thing when I'm cutting mouth plates. You know, it's just a part of the process that you can just make a bunch at once. So um, the next thing we're gonna do is kinda, you can see how this is going to I've got on my top plate, I've got a center line marked down here. I've also marked a line here, and that's where we're going to be uh, putting the hinge eventually. So I'm just going to try and line this up so that that is centered about like that, just past that line. I don't know if you guys can see that. And so now the next step is going to be to glue, to draw roughly where you want your glue to go. So I'm going to take this to the spray booth again. We probably won't show that step of the process because it's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, and we're going to glue those down. I'll show you what it looks like once it's done. Uh, and we're going to do the same thing on the bottom. So uh, on your bottom plate. Whoop, whoop, whoop. So 
I'm just gonna mark that out where I'm gonna put the glue for my pieces roughly. Again, no one's ever gonna see this, so it's kind of your working palette. Um, it's important to remember uh, which side of the plates to use, so remember we're going to be when it's in its closed position, it's going to look like this. So the bevel on the back is going like this. And the reason for that is that your hand can get over that without having, um, having something sharp. You know, it's just, it's just a smoother edge. Um, and it also means you can open the mouth up for, further. Um, so, and you don't get a weird crease on the inside of the mouth. So that's the reasoning for that. So we're gonna be gluing these suede pieces down to the plates um, uh, off camera. Um, and what we're also going to be doing, and this is kind of important, is to um, measuring the size of your elastic loops. Now, I've done this two different ways. Um, I've done this where I've just put a stitch line down here, and um, the only problem with that is that it tends to uh, flatten out, uh, uh, which the problem with that is like if you're changing puppets really quickly, you want to you want to just be able to slide your hand in. So. Um, the better way to do that is actually to glue your elastic to itself, which kind of kills every part of the costumer in me who, you know, doesn't, tries to use uh, stitching over, over glues usually, but this actually works really well. Um, and what we'll be doing is marking, you know, once I get, so I want my thumb to sit in here like this, and I also want a little bit of an angle so that the top of the sleeve is has a wider circumference than down at the bottom so it just kind of pinches my thumb in there um, and as you're doing this you guys are just gonna want to play around and see what feels right um, it, it takes some experimentation like I make these all the time and I'll still have you know something like ah, I screwed that one up so it's just a weird thing there's no one way everybody's hands are a little bit different sizes the the elastic does allow for, for some expansion in there but you also don't want to cut the circulation off of a puppeteer's fingers um, I've known people who make these little rings out of out of um, some of that like sport, sports foam padding or the fun foam. Um, they're great and they stretch and they do all really nice things, um, but eventually they break down over time or kind of come unglued. So this is really the method that I like to do. So I'm going to be finding those and uh, making my loop sizes. I'm going to glue those up and then I'll show you what that looks like uh, when we're back. So guys, I went to go glue the things together and um, I realized I forgot a step. So um, in case it isn't uh, abundantly clear already, I'm not used to making videos like this, mm -hmm. so please bear with me. Um, something you need to do before you glue all those finger loop pieces down is actually create the hinge. Um, what I like to use for the hinges is actually um, gaff tape. Um, it works really well. Um, what I usually do, I'm going to show you this and I'm going to rip it off um, and, because what I like to do is actually glue it down uh, with barge as well um, so that it's super, super secure. If you don't have, um, if you don't have gaff tape, if you're building this, you know, at your kitchen table or whatever and forgot your gaff at work, um, you can use fabric or something like that uh, and, and a contact cement in the same way. But, but I just really like using barge and, and with the gaff tape because it works really well. So we're gonna take our pieces, also peel these stickers off. Um, we're gonna take our pieces and they're, we're gonna lay them out like this. And on the back, we're gonna kinda cleanly, evenly lay this out. I'm gonna flip it. This way would actually be easier. It's funny when you're filming things, you learn what you just do intuitively without uh, mentioning to an audience, so. Um, so this is going to be the inside of the mouth, the side that the tape is on. And again, we're going to be, we're going to be gluing that as well. And then you lose about three quarters of an inch with these little divots. Um, so I do like on the top plate, make a line. I just do the little math on there, you know, take two inches. Um, by the time you've got the little divots and the plate in between, it's about an inch. So you've got uh, a half inch on each side. That's not essential. It's just a little bit of, you know, it helps things be a little smoother. So I do try to carefully lay it on that first line on the top plate. Then you fold your pieces 
I'm gonna get rid of some of this excess tape. Don't worry, those are gingers, but they are my craft shear gingers. Uh, they're kind of my all purpose, so they are used to this. They're gonna make sure this is nice and tight in here. Have a nice hard crease. Make sure all the pieces are lined up. And you'd be doing this with the glue also. And then start to fold, start to fold your tape over. I'm gonna open it back up, fold the other joint the same way. And do a nice hard tape crease there. Once this is done and glued on and everything, you know, you've got a nice joint that does that hinge thing I was talking about. And I usually just take a, you know, a pair of scissors or a knife and just clean up the edges here. This is all going to get covered up as well. So once this is glued down, it's going to be a lot sturdier um, and it's going to hold up really nicely. So um, this is another very important part because you don't want to be going back and having to repair that all the time. So that's the mouth plate hinge. Hi friends. So uh, we just got the finger loops and the hinges put onto this little mouth plate. I'm just going to hold it still for a second so you can see what's going on. Um, so these elastics, they were glued across the top. Again, they're made to fit my fingers in this way. You know, so I've got some control there. Um, and then on the bottom side, you can see, I know we mentioned this earlier, but you can see what I meant about having, you know, having your thumb loop so that it's actually got a broader circumference around this top where your, where your thumb goes in and it gets a little skinnier, so it kind of just pinches your thumb in there. Um, so as a result, we get these little rabbit ears that we will chop off just so they'll stay out of the way. Um, don't be tempted as I have been in the past to try and stitch down uh, the edges of your loops. Uh, I, I was doing that for a while because I thought, gosh, that's going to be even more secure. Um, but what I found out is that when puppeteers were putting their hands in, it was actually catching on their fingers and, and kind of hurting their fingers. So uh, they asked me to remove that. So I had to do some surgery on that also. So, so yeah, don't, don't do that. The glue will hold. Um, just have faith in the glue. We'll also trim up these little tails that are sticking off. Again, this won't be seen, but we want to make it as clean as possible for the puppeteer uh, to be able to use this. So this is our mouth plate. Right now it's, it's clacky, but you can also see that thing I was talking about of way to, ways to get more expression by having that center, the center plate in here. You can get, you know, you can stick out your, you can stick out your bottom lip and be angry or, you know, you know, have a little bit of a dumbfounded like smile that way. So, um, so that's the reason for that. Um, so that is the mouth plate. Um, there are a few more things that we need to do to it. The first thing is to cover the inside. Uh, so this will be visible to the audience. Uh, and we need to cover that with felt. So I've got the classic Muppets either use red or um, black felt for this part. Um, and they're a little bit inconsistent in some of them. Some characters have black uh, insides of their mouths. Some have red. Um, Basically, we're just gonna cut this out a shape a little bit bigger. You know, I'm just gonna use this for my gluing, you know, as I'm, as I'm gluing down, just as a template to follow. Cut that out not very neatly. Um, and then the next thing that we'll do, and I'll just show you once these are attached, um, uh, we're going to make the, the throat. So the throat is kind of like this weird kidney bean shape thing that you can see uh, if you leave this little divot, if you cut that little divot out, it'll make the um, uvula, the thing that hangs down in the back of your throat that most of the Muppets have. And then a little pink kind of uh, schlumpy heart shape uh, that will go down here. And we will attach those, those, those two pieces with um, fa the Fabri-Tac glue um, and, you know, we'll place those. So, um, but the next step is going to be to attach the red felt to the inside of the mouth plate. Um, barge or contact cement works really well for this. Um, for today's sake, uh, I've also used, uh, just for time and dry time and things like that, uh, I'm gonna use Super 77. So I'm gonna spray both sides, uh, 
give them a nice good coat, wait for a few seconds, and then put them together. Um, and that's how we'll do that, let them off gas. Uh, and then we'll trim out uh, the edge uh, around the wood plates here. Then we'll put in these, uh, the, the uvula and the tongue, and uh, we'll have a mouth plate almost finished at that point. Okay, so the next thing we're gonna work on, we're not quite to the step of installing it yet, but we're gonna need a little hoop that goes at the bottom of the neck, the bottom of the head at the neck. Um, and what that does is that's gonna hold the, uh, basically the opening that your hand goes in, it's gonna hold that open, it's gonna provide some support for the head, um, and it's also gonna give us a place to attach the sleeve that goes down the neck, and it goes all the way through the body down to your elbow. Um, it's gonna give us a place to attach that onto. So what I like to use is uh, Rigoline. Um, when I've got it in stock, I'll use this um, wonderful uh, fabric covered Rigoline because it's then easier to stitch back into. So I just leave a little bit at the end, you know, maybe a half inch. So the Rigoline is actually clipped back about a half inch and we'll turn that over uh, when we're stitching it down. But to get that measurement, Basically what you're gonna do is find what fits your hand through or whoever's going to be the puppeteer on this. So uh, comfortably easy, you know. So we're going to make the head foam actually line up with this. We're gonna ease it onto this ring uh, instead of trying to match the, the pattern piece. Um, everybody's hands are a little bit different. Uh, so what we're gonna do, so I've got my, I've got my I've got my size, I'm gonna make a little mark there, and then I'm going to measure that mark. So for me, I need 11 inches to go around my hand. Um, so we're actually going to go make this piece just over 12 inches. We're gonna clip down the other side, clip the boning back just a little bit. Um, and we're gonna make it over so that it overlaps. We've got about an inch of overlap once we once we're going. So um, it's pretty straightforward. We're gonna fold our little ends. I'm gonna match up. It's hard to pin. I will say that. So I don't. I don't even usually try. Um, we're gonna match it up to our line inside there. We're gonna sleeve it over the machine here, which it just fits. And I usually do um, some back and forth zigzag stitches up the edges, and that's how I generally hold it in. And that tends to work pretty well. So these are gonna be set, it's like set on a three and a two on a Bernina 1008. You kinda have to force it through your machine a little bit because the feed dogs don't always wanna catch. It looks a little gross in, the, in this form, but it's gonna get hidden. Uh, we're gonna be gluing this inside the puppet's head. And what matters more than the function, or more than the look is the function. Uh, so we just wanna make sure it's nice and secure. Pull those threads back. She's not the prettiest gal at the ball, but she will hold up and be strong and we'll be able to fit through here and that'll pro provide a lot of support for our neck. So that's the neck ring. Okay, so we have our mouth plate completed. We got the felt added on the inside here. I've also uh, tacked down with some fabric tack very carefully uh, the tongue and the throat pieces. Uh, just a real quick thing, you can if that line is too sharp for your preference, you can take a red marker or a, you know, some paint or something like that and you can actually go in and just shade the tongue a little bit. Uh, some folks will actually like upholster their tongues so that they, you know, that they really have a lot of dimension and character to them. Um, I usually just do this um, 
this sort of shading here to give them a little look. Um, if you if you don't like the sharp marker line, you can also take a little bit of isopropyl alcohol and a brush and go in there and dilute that a little bit, um, and it works really well. Um, so now what we need to do is glue the mouth plate into the head. So I've gone in and kind of roughed in a line all the way around here, and it's about, it's between a quarter and three sixteenths in. I just kind of freehanded it. Um, what we're gonna be doing, we're actually gonna be applying glue within that line, that ring all the way around, and on the edge all the way around. And we'll do the same, we'll, we'll glue inside the mouth all the way. And we're going to meet it up like this. You know, it's finding the center, making sure the center is lined up. And we're gonna glue the edges just like this. And then we're gonna move to the center of the little connector plate in between here. And we're gonna make sure that lines up on the center of the cheek, uh, that angle that's cut out in the cheek. We're gonna make sure that meets in the center. And then, you know, we're gonna tack center front top, center top front bottom, and each side we're gonna kinda tack those with the glue. And then we're gonna carefully make the others meet. So we're gonna be gluing around the edge, you know, on the edge of the wood onto the back of the plate. Now it's gonna get really close to your finger loops and that is okay. You can make little slits if you need, if it's too tight. Um, but actually jamming your fingers up in there into the foam isn't gonna show through the puppet. Uh, you won't see that when you're performing um, and it's gonna give you a little bit of extra security to feel like you're really in there um, and have a lot of control. So I'm gonna to go to the spray booth and do that uh, now. I'm also going to be gluing in this ring that we made a few minutes ago. So I'm gonna actually need to stretch the foam to meet up with this ring. So I'm gonna mark the center back, center front, and do sort of the same thing and just kind of walk it around the edge. If your loop is really, really large and you need to cut, you can always slit open the back here and add a little triangle wedge piece um, if you need a little more room in your foam pattern. So I'm gonna do that now and show you what that looks like in the next step. Okay hey guys, I just got back from the spray booth. We've glued our mouth plate in, we've glued the little neck ring in, and uh, let it off gas, and uh, it's starting to look like a puppet head, I think. So, uh, so you can see we've got, we glued this seam in here and here carefully, again, finding the center points and here at the sides. You can kind of get an idea of what the cheeks are doing there when they're closed. See how that kind of pooches out like that? It gives it that little cute grin. Um, you can play with all of those shapes in your pattern piece. Like if you want bigger cheeks, uh, you can obviously just make that piece bigger and then it'll just, you know, more easing as you're gluing in. Um, if you want different lips, this one kind of has like a little derpy thing, which I kind of think is fun, but if you want uh, want to give it big lips, you can actually like apply uh, a piece of foam and, you know, just kind of carve it down here or here. Um, and this would be the time to do that in the process if you want to change anything about the shape. But I'm pretty happy where this little basic guy is. Um, sometimes after you've glued, you might want to like loosen that hinge up a little bit. Yeah, it feels very mean to do that, but it actually is gonna gonna help you. So now we can get more of that or the um, type of type of grin. So um, this is the base of our puppet head. So now we have the fun and sometimes daunting task of covering it. Um, what we're gonna use today, this is called Antron fleece. Um, it's also known as Muppet fleece. Um, was actually just given a bunch of this by our good milliner friend who works over there, Arlie. Um, he had some he wasn't using, so we're gonna use this today. Um, what, what makes this different from other kinds of fleece that you might buy at the local fabric store? Um, it's thicker. It does stretch one direction, but not the other, which is pretty typical. Um, it's uh, dyeable, which is, I think it's probably a nylon base, so it's, you know, it, it will take even writ dye really nicely. Now, I like to get this stuff, um, I think it's called Georgia Stage. Uh, they've got a website and you can order it. Sometimes they, they only run small lots of it and when they run out, then they have to run another. So I have had it where I've called and you know had a month delay while they're milling new fabric. Um, there are other companies that do sell this. Um, there's one called puppetpelts.com and they will actually, what, what they kind of specialize is in, is dyeing it, custom dyeing the color that you need from a swatch book. They have hundreds and hundreds of colors. 
um, and then they'll ship it right to you already dyed. Um, we're just going to use it in its white form today because that's what we've got. Now there are a couple ways to think about covering this um, with the fleece. Uh, you, want to you want the stretch to go side to side, not up and down. So let's make sure we've got that. So this is the way we're stretching. We're going to basically lay the puppet face down here. And we're just going to try and loosely pin at first. Now this method that we're doing today, so you know, you can see where the mouth is inside there. We're just going to kind of roughly pin this in to start with. What this method allows you is um, fewer seams. So if you're like hand stitching it and just kind of like tail, it, it, this is this feels more like upholstery to me um, than working with a pattern. So I would rather not have a big seam down the center front. So we're going to now we've got it pulled around the back. Now we're going to pull it at the bottom, roughly feel in there. The glue seams actually, you can feel through there and they'll give you a good uh, center front line. And then we'll just pin it again here on the top. Now we're still gonna have to have seams, but this way we're not gonna have to have them as visible. Um, and you, in this step, you can kind of choose where you want your seams to be because you've got all of this here. Where do you wanna take a dart? Um, so that's going to be kind of up to you um, in what kind of character you're creating. So like what, is there going to be a wig or hair or a hat or something like that that's going to cover up seams in the back? Um, are you going to have uh, glasses or something like that that might actually, maybe the seam is taken right here along the leg line so it just kind of blends in. Another cool thing about Antron fleece uh, or Muppet fleece is that you're able to, uh, once you get it stitched together, you can take like a toothbrush or a little comb and you can actually go in and pull those fibers out and it um, disguises your seams a lot better. Um, so that's a really cool thing about that. So I'm gonna be spending some time uh, figuring out where I want my seams, kind of stretching it, tightening it. Anybody, anybody who's ever done some, uh, some like draping uh, straight onto a form understands what this process is. So by the next time when we come back, I will show you and we'll have it all pinned together. We'll have some seams cut out and then I'll talk about how we stitch it together. Okay, so back again. Uh, I've spent probably the last 15 or 20 minutes um, just kind of playing with this uh, fleece and uh, getting some darts that I'm okay with living with. So I've got, a, I did end up doing a dart down here at, uh, just underneath, you know, underneath the lip down. Um, I've got two darts, one that, some that run up the sides of the head that I thought that might, you know, not show too badly. And then in the back we have where everything meets. Now that's going to probably, you know, in a normal puppet that would probably be covered up completely. So, um, that's just how I've, uh, laid this particular one out. Um, it is possible to pattern this, especially if you're going to make a bunch of these. Um, it would probably be worth developing a pattern. I always find that there's still some wooding and things you have to do um, just because of the nature of the fleece um, and the way you cut it out so it doesn't always work perfectly. Um, uh, so I just like to kind of upholster it in this fashion. Um, also wanted to point out that I have left the mouth at least partially open. You definitely want to leave your mouth open. You don't need it to be closed. You don't want it to be closed because what we're going to be doing and this is always something that even, you know, I've made hundreds of puppets and this is still the thing that terrifies me a little bit is making this first slice into the mouth. So I just take my snips, you know, I try to be a little conservative at first, but you do want it to get all the way down into those corners. You can see what we've got going on here. You know, you can start to see how this is going to work. Um, I'm now going to trim this back. And uh, there are several options of how to finish this inside lip. Um, you could turn the fleece under and actually stitch it with a curved needle into the felt. It's pretty time consuming, but it's a really nice look. Um, what we're going to do today, just for these basic starter puppets, is actually just trim down and I'm just going to kind of eyeball 
I'm gonna turn it like this and just kind of eyeball a little lip overlap. And I'm guessing that's about an eighth inch to three sixteenths of an inch of where it's gonna overlap into onto the mouth plate there. I'm gonna do that all around. I'm gonna start with the bottom just to show you. Be careful doing this. Um, I have screwed up some puppets in the past by being not by cutting too aggressively and then not having enough. Now we should you should be able to fix it, but it's um, it's nicer if you can get it obviously right on the first try. So there's so there we go. That's how that bottom lip is going to look. We're going to do the same thing to the top as well. Um, and then I like to take some pins and actually turn this down so we don't get glue on the fleece until we're ready. I also, for, for making puppets, I like to use the yellow headed quilters pins just because you can see them and easily get at them. Um, not a huge fan of the standard pins that don't have big fat heads because these are just easier to find. Uh, especially like if you're working with fur, it gets really hard to find uh, to find your pins sometimes. And the last thing you would wanna do is send off a puppet to a client that had a pin in it. Uh, same way with a costume. Uh, you just, you just wanna be careful. So, so again, this is that Beacon Fabri-Tac. Um, you could also use barge if you're a really careful gluer. I'm going to just do a little bead. Just basically the width of the tip of the uh, of the glue container nozzle. I'm going to do that right onto the red felt, and I'm just going to go from corner to corner. And then I am also going to put a little bit on the outside just to help hold things in place. Okay, so I've got my got my beads of glue on there. So now it's time to be very careful and especially working with white fleece, you want to be really careful not to get too many glue burns or anything like that. Um, and you want to just turn this in and glue it down to your mouth plate. And you'll need to open up wide to get into those corners. And you may even need to make a little snip inside there, depending, you know, just depending on the way your fleece is laid out on the mouth. It's pretty intuitive. I guess you could draw out a line on the inside uh, to, to uh, use as a guide, but um, I think it's pretty easy to see when you're off the mark. So I've got some little snips that I'm going to Little, little areas that I'm going to snip off and clean those up a little bit that we're, when I cut that, I could have just been a little bit cleaner. Sometimes to get an extra uh, little bit of dimension, I'll actually take a lighter colored marker or a marker that's, or, sorry, a darker colored marker, uh, just a little bit darker than whatever the fleece color is, and I'll actually do a little shadow line inside there. Um, Sharpie works okay. I usually want to go back through and wipe it off or do the alcohol thing just to make sure there's not a lot because uh, it can easily spread if it's not dry um, or if it starts to rub off. I've actually, especially for fur matching, like for to get some dimension in fur, um, if you don't want to use paint, I've actually found that the Faber Castile markers um, are really nice, uh, but they do also require some like applying it, waiting for it to dry, uh, and then wiping off some of the excess. Once that excess is wiped off, it's, they, don't, they don't fade too badly. Now we're gonna do the same part on this top plate. I suppose you could do this step after everything is all stitched together too. I just don't usually do it that way. 
think everybody kind of has their own method that they they like and you know those of us who make puppets will kind of steal from each other you know uh, get ideas um, my process kind of evolves and changes um, over time all right so I'm not gonna spend time showing you the gluing of this because we've already done that so I'll do that off camera um, but I do want to show you and talk a little bit about how to stitch this stuff up. Um, I'm going to use red thread so that hopefully you'll have a chance to see that against the white a little bit better. Normally you would want to use thread that matches. I'm going to start on this seam here. Hopefully, you know, kind of straighten it up so it looks nice. Um, I pin everything flat. Um, and then as I'm stitching, uh, the stitch that I'm going to show you, it's basically just a ladder stitch and uh, it kind of pulls things in and kind of turns stuff under as you go. And there's enough stretch in the fleece that, that that works well. So I usually use a double thread, like a double strand with a big, big fat knot at the end so we don't pull through. Um, and I usually start at the very point of the dart, about an eighth of an inch up from the point. And these measurements are all, you know, somewhat made up. Um, but once you've got your thread in, what, we're, what, what the ladder stitch is gonna do, we're basically gonna go an eighth inch over and prick through, just catching the fleece, and then come up about an eighth of an inch, pull through. Then we're gonna go straight across the seam about an eighth inch and come up and do the same thing. And then you just alternate sides doing that, you know, until your seam is, is uh, stitched up. And I like to get it in kind of loose at first and then, uh, you know, once you're three or four stitches in, kind of push that, push on the seam a little bit with your finger and pull tight and uh, it just, draws everything in together, it kind of turns the fabric underneath um, so you don't have any raw edges or anything like that. And um, you know, once you've gone an inch or two, you'll be really surprised at how even this red thread is going to start to disappear. For a long time I used to read about this you know, this was before the days of the internet when I started making puppets as a kid, and you would hear about this elusive stitch that Jim Henson made, and you know, this wonderful secretive uh, Henson stitch. Basically, it's just a ladder stitch. Um, and I remember learning that and being kind of like, oh, oh, is that all it is? Um, but anyway, that's, that's kind of cool. It's really great. There are a lot of really great puppet resources online. Uh, I mean, a Google search will turn up anything. Um, so I'm gonna stop for a second and show you that really starts to disappear there. And uh, we're not even all the way down. Uh, and, and I haven't even brushed it out yet. I don't have a little brush. I'll find a little toothbrush or something um, that will pull the extra little fibers out of that seam. And it's really gonna disguise itself. Even this red thread kind of hides in the light. So that is the, that's the idea behind what we're doing. So we just need to now take all of these seams. Um, I usually, you know, like start, start from the point and just kind of work them until you get it all stitched up. Once we get to the bottom, for this, I will actually turn it under and just stitch right into this uh, Rigoline boning that we put in, into the fabric casing uh, to get a nice clean edge there. Um, we're not gonna be able to get to this in this video uh, to make a body or arms or anything like that. That's, you know, a whole, that's a whole other process. But basically, just so you understand how this, the puppets are put together, I'll pull that thread down, uh, there would normally be a sleeve that attaches up there to that ring, and that sleeve would come down to about your elbow, and then uh, you might wanna cover the neck in the matching uh, fleece as well, just to have a little bit of neck showing. And then that entire sleeve slides down into the body pod and it's free, it moves freely inside the neck. The neck has a corresponding ring as well uh, to keep it nice and open, and so it, it just moves inside this ring. And your attachment point is actually down at the bottom. 
uh, so that gravity just pulls everything down when you're when you're performing on your arm. So that's that's generally what we would do. Um, sorry, we're not going to have time for that today, but you can probably look up resources like that as well. So I'm going to take a few minutes and start stitching this up, and uh, I'll show you what we got when we get back. Hello. Um, so we have this puppet almost stitched up and it is near the end of the day so we're just gonna talk really quickly about uh, brushing the fr brushing the fleece out so you can just take a toothbrush you can do that you can also just take like a little pin and get in there you know the more you work this the the more your little seam lines are gonna are gonna uh, start to disappear um, if you're working with puppets in film or on TV uh, you want to definitely pay attention to that because that is the camera will pick that up. But we're gonna stop here and we're gonna throw some eyes on. So basically, for this project, I'm going to just be using some kind of generic little doll or teddy bear eyes. This little fella kind of reminded me of a crash test dummy. And so we're just gonna, we're just gonna go with something like that. And uh, if you've never used these, basically there's just a, it's the eye with a little shaft that uh, uh, these little washers slide down onto and lock. So I'm just going to pop those in place really quickly. And uh, then we're going to have the base of a puppet head. Now, um, this is obviously just the base and this is obviously just the head. So um, other things that you could do to you know, flesh this project out, uh, you could pop ears on there or facial hair or regular hair. Um, all sorts of things work. You could play with different types of eyes. I mean. I think everybody has heard like Kermit's eyes are like ping pong balls cut in half and some of the other Muppets are um, uh, white plastic spoons that have felt glued to them, you know, like the ends cut off and sanded down. Uh, so really, uh, you can do pretty much anything you want. Um, if you're doing an eye that has, that's more than this, like uh, something that has both the white and the pupil, um, check it in a mirror, that works really well. Check placement in a mirror or on, on a camera or something like that. Um, sometimes when we're just sitting here looking like this, placing eyes, um, it can be a little deceptive. So having a little bit of that distance and a little bit of the camera, you wanna make it look like it's, uh, it's looking at you. So play around, have lots of fun. Um, definitely hit me up if you have any questions. Um, my email, uh, I've, I can con you can contact me through my website. It's Brandon. Or, sorry, it's Brandon Kirkham Designs .com, um, and you can contact me that way if you have any questions. Um, and good luck, and have fun making. Puppets.